Okay, so now we're looking at the topic uh, entitled Staying in Balance. This is my third, third go at recording this one, so fingers crossed this one will stick. Um, so, staying in balance is the topic here, and the posh word for this is homeostasis. So, homeostasis uh, comes from, uh, I can't remember if it's Greek or Latin to be honest, but homeo basically means the same, and stasis means to stay, so staying the same. Um, and it's all about maintaining a stable internal environment, so keeping the conditions inside your body the same. And that is regardless of if there are any changes outside your body. So the most obvious example would be if it's really cold outside, your body still has to stay the same temperature on the inside. Now, this process is controlled by both the nervous system and the hormones. Um, that run around your body. Now the name for the hormonal system is, the proper name, is the endocrine system. So if you're looking to take uh, the higher paper, if you can get used to talking about the endocrine system, that would be great. So it's really important to keep the conditions in your body the same, and that's because of the con it's about maintaining the conditions that the cells in your body particularly need. Um, your cells being the things that make all the processes in your body happen. So the conditions we want are the ones that are most favourable to your cells. So things that we keep in balance are water, carbon dioxide, your body temperature and your blood glucose levels. The last two are the ones that we're going to look at in detail. You don't need to worry about the first two so much. It's just good to know that they are things that we do keep constant. So let's start with temperature. So the posh name for keeping the temperature in your body the same is thermoregulation and it just means how we keep a steady body temperature. Hopefully we all remember that your body temperature should be 37 degrees C and that is because it's the temperature at which chemical reactions in your body happen at the fastest and that's because it's the best temperature for enzymes, something we will talk about a little later in the course but enzymes are a type of chemical that um, make reactions happen faster basically. Now, we have to make sure we keep this temperature in our body, because if we don't, we can get illnesses such as hypothermia and heat stroke, which are just how our body is affected by extreme temperature. And if it goes too far, if we do get too hot or too cold, we can die. So, quite an important thing to make sure we're getting right. So, we just need to know what our body does if it gets too hot or too cold. So... For our body to stay warm, so to keep us warm, our body can shiver, which uses up energy, and is very closely related to releasing energy from food. Basically, this is saying that we take the chemical energy from our food and we make our muscles work to convert it into heat energy to warm our body up. Next thing that our body does to keep warm is something called vasoconstriction. If you can learn to spell this one correctly, that would be good. Vasoconstriction is basically the name for changing the route that our blood flows through our body. There's a picture on the next slide, so don't worry, I'll show it in a bit more detail. But basically, if we want to stay warm, we want to keep our warmth inside us near our vital organs, so our blood is directed to flow near our vital organs. And then the last thing that we do to keep warm, which I'm sure you know, is your hairs on your body stand on end. So if you've ever been somewhere cold, you know that you get goosebumps. And this basically just um, reduces the loss of heat from your skin. Now, if we want to keep cool, our body does some of the opposite things. So our hairs lie flat, because that makes it easier to radiate heat, to get rid of that heat. We do something called vasodilation, which is the opposite of vasoconstriction. So instead of making our blood flow near the centre of our body, near our vital organs, we encourage it to flow near the surface of our skin, so that it's easier for the heat to be radiated away. And the other thing we do to keep cool is we sweat, which I'm sure you're all very aware of. Um, so if we sweat when we're hot, it means that the liquid on our skin then evaporates. And when it evaporates, it takes that heat into the environment, so cools us down. So those are the ways that we can keep cool. And these processes are controlled by a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Um, you only need to be aware of this term if you go for the higher paper, but it is a word you may have come across in a lot of sciencey programs I like to mention it, but it is the hypothalamus that controls the temperature in our body. So this is the picture I was talking about which should make the vasoconstriction, vasodilation a little bit clearer. So it's this bit that I'm particularly interested in. So if it's a cold day 
what happens is that your blood is going to flow through the vessels that are closer to the centre of your body. And the way that's done is that these blood vessels, the ones that are near the skin, uh, shrink. They're basically made smaller. They constrict. And that's why it's called vasoconstriction. And because they get smaller, the blood doesn't run through these ones. It just runs through, or most of it runs through, the blood vessels that are nearer the centre of the body, which allows that heat to be kept inside. So the opposite, the vasodilation, is when these blood vessels, the ones near the skin, get bigger. And because they're bigger, it's easier for the blood to flow through them, so we get more blood flow close to the surface of the skin so that the heat can be lost to the surroundings. Okay, and it just shows you hairs and sweats, but I'm pretty sure we got those. It's just this idea of what's going on with the blood vessels that can be a little difficult. So that's how we maintain our body temperature. So the next bit we need to talk about is our blood glucose levels. So our glucose levels are really important because glucose is a chemical that we use for energy in our body and we'll use it for pretty much everything breathing moving living really without the glucose we're in a bit of trouble so our blood glucose levels change throughout the day and it depends what's been happening so our blood glucose levels will be particularly high after we've eaten and they're likely to be particularly low when we've done a lot of activity recently. So if you've been using your muscles a lot, you will have used up a lot of your glucose and the glucose levels are likely to drop. They'll also drop if you haven't eaten for a while. So sometimes people can feel a little bit faint when they haven't eaten and that's because their glucose levels get too low. So what does our body do if our blood glucose is too high? So how do we make the level go down? Well, the organ in our body that's responsible for detecting this is the pancreas. So the pancreas detects that we have too much blood uh, glucose in our blood, that the level needs to be lowered. It then releases a hormone called insulin. Now insulin basically tells the liver and some other cells around the body, but mostly the liver, to convert the glucose into glycogen. Now glycogen is a chemical that we can store. So it's just a way of storing that glucose ready for when it needs to be used. But it stops the glucose levels from getting too high because that can cause problems in the body. Now, if our blood glucose level gets too low and we need it to increase, so for instance we're um, doing exercise, so we're using up the glucose, so we need more to be released into our body. Well, the pancreas is what detects this again. And this time it releases a hormone called glucagon. And this time, this stimulates the liver and muscle cells to convert the glucogen back into glucose. I know it's a bit of a pain getting your name around all these names, but uh, with a little bit of practice, you'll get there. So glucose is the one that gives us the energy we use in our cells. Glycogen is the one that we store. Insulin is the one that makes us do the storing. And glucagon is the one that makes us get the glucose back. If you just have a quick read through these ones, it should hopefully make sense. Now, I'm sure you are aware, we'll cover this in a bit more detail in another topic, but people with diabetes can't control their insulin levels, so their pancreas doesn't correctly release insulin into their blood. So, obviously, they have problems controlling their blood glucose level. So, just a little bit of note, both of these control systems, both for the glucose level and for your body temperature, are what we refer to as negative feedback. And that basically means they'd work the same way as an incubator or as a thermostat in your house. So the way they would work is that if the temperature gets too low, the heater turns on. So when, the, when it gets cold, the heater comes on. So with your body, if you get too cold, we start doing things that make you warmer. If your glucose level gets too low, your body starts doing things that increase your glucose level. When it then gets too high, in the case of an incubator or the thermostat, the heater would turn off. So in the case of your body, if you get too hot, your body starts to do the things to cool it down. With your glucose level, if your glucose level gets too high, your body starts to do the things to reduce your glucose level. Um, so this idea of basically acting on what's happened is called negative feedback because we try and do the opposite of the situation we're in so if it's too hot we try and make it cold if it's too cold we try and make it hot and i'm sure you're quite aware of that process but we just need to hook to that 
the, uh, the name of negative feedback. If they ever ask you about negative feedback, that's what they mean. So that's the end of this particular topic. I hope it's not been too confusing for you. I know there's lots of words that you have to try and get your head around, but we'll be doing some practice with them when I see you in class. So good luck with all those. Remember, if you've got any questions, write them down and ask them when you see me.